What's up, guys? We're live. So we got the OG of the dating community, Paul Janka, joining us today. This is a podcast that's been a long time in the making, but I'm glad Ooh. we can finally make it happen. Uh, so if you guys have been in the in the pickup community for a while, you will know who Paul Janka is. But I think there's going to be some guys who are new, who might not be familiar. So do you want to start off with a quick introduction? Hmm. Um, yeah, I haven't done that for a while. But basically, uh, just to let your audience know, I'm, I'm quite a bit older. I'm 47 now. So my days of running around are long gone, but I still have a business teaching that and selling product. I, I was, I would say in my early, like kind of your age, I think you said you're in your early thirties, late twenties and early thirties, I was living in New York and I just, I was doing everything wrong. And then through a series of events, I found my eyes open to a different way to approach dating and I unlocked and all of a sudden the women were flooding in. I did a series of things, very totally different, like sort of non-intuitive series of things. And I refined that process over time and uh, wrote a book, held seminars, and was very successful teaching dating. Basically, guys who want to get laid, want to meet, have a lot of girls in their life, want sort of casual relationships. I mastered that, wrote a book, built a business. And that was in like 2007, 8, 9, 10. So over 10 years ago, 15 years ago. But um, yeah, it was cool. And and a lot of there were a lot of men who really resonated with that. And did very well themselves and followed up and started businesses themselves. So there's a lot of guys out there who sort of taken my early stuff and developed, you know, evolved it or developed on it and stuff. And things have changed now because of course now it's like Tinder, Tinder of all these dating apps. Back then it was the flip phone. And if you wanted to do online dating, it was like match.com. So it was, didn't have as much digital stuff really. Yeah. Yeah. You, you were doing your thing in New York uh, right around that time. I was like striking out in high school or something. Like if we look at the, like yeah, back then. In 2000, in 2005, when I wrote Getting Late in NYC, how old were you? What were you doing? I was in uh, cruising into high school. I would have been a freshman. Oh my God. Okay. Yeah. I mean, funny <laughs> enough, I've had customers that are in their like teens and stuff, like end of high school customers are they, if I knew what I knew then back in high school, I would have cleaned up. I mean, I, I do regret, uh, I left a lot of money on the table, so to speak. Sure, and, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, that's but, you say that I always felt the same way. Yeah. Especially college more so not even high school, but college. When I was mm -hmm. in college, I had this golden opportunity where I was living in a frat house where we would have parties that were like three girls for every guy. And I still managed to strike out the vast majority of the time. So where'd you go? I, did you go to school with hot chicks? Yeah, I went to Boston University, which oh, is okay, yeah. like seventy percent women, thirty percent men. Or something. I used to live on Alston and Alston on Com Ave, right before Harvard Ave, I think. So I had a flat. Yeah. So I, 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 did, I, I made a dent in the when I was older because I lived in Boston after school. I I made a dent in the uh, Boston BU population. What, what years was that? That was late nineties, so like ninety nine, uh, two thousand, two thousand one, two thousand two. Okay, okay, okay. I moved to New York City in two thousand two, so. Then I hit the then I hit the big leagues, right? Okay, so let's start off with this question: What made you get into game in the first place? Why did you start pickup? Um, well, it wasn't it wasn't a conscious thing. I just actually there is a story about that. If I go way way back, I had a running mate, and he and I uh, he ended up being very good with women as well. And we were living in we were friends in Boston, and he kind of passed over a couple of sort of handed me some golden opportunities with women. And I was kind of appreciative. And then he came to New York a few times and he wanted to do something with me creatively. And like, we were both, I, I don't know, something, something in the, the acting film field. And so what we did is we hired his, actually his father paid for it. We, we flew to Boston and he hired a film crew to follow us around all day. And we just did all kinds of man on the street stunts. Like we got, I remember we got a Japanese couple with a kid. We got the kid out and the woman got into the pram and the husband pushed the the wife in the baby pram like down the street and we filmed it like we just got we we found we were very persuasive getting people to do stuff in front of the camera and it was a bit addictive and then of course we were young guys so we started finding hot girls and asking them to do stuff not create not like girls gone wild exactly but just r r silly stuff like stand in the middle of a road on one leg and everyone was so compliant and then we were like wow this is cool so when we got back to new york we just started doing that on the street but obviously we started targeting like the hot chicks. And then at the end we'd say, here, give us your number. And they would, and then I would text them. And as you can imagine, cause I was young and horny, like that stuff started to lead to like asking them to go out on a date. And so it sort of, it evolved over time. I mean, it went from being sort of innocent to like, then I, 
five years later, it was industrial and I was banging tons of chicks every week, every month and stuff. But uh, in the beginning, it was just the, the thrill of like acting on the street. Because pickup, I mean, yeah. yes, getting a number is important. But the, for me, if I think back way, way back, the most exciting pickups are like the ones where the girl was laughing. It was like electric. We had like a, even a connection. We were just like both of us playing our roles and like almost on script and having those are golden. Mm. So that- in a way, it was like theater on the street, but it always oh, it became with the end the goal to get the number, of course. That's that's really interesting. I've never heard that. Like like most people are like, yeah, you know, I was frustrated, I couldn't get laid, and then I really just wanted to get laid. But yours was more just like having fun and theater. Yeah, exactly, theater. Yeah, it wasn't about sex. I wonder if that's part of the reason that what made you successful is because you didn't really care about the outcome. You were just trying to have exactly. Fun. Yeah, yeah. Do, I do mean, think- eventually, yeah, you do it enough. You get. I got very good at it, but and 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 but that's not why I started. And I just love the thrill of the of the theater itself. Because I, I probably am a frustrated actor. I should, probably should have been an actor in one way. So goofing around with people, and particularly hot chicks on the street, fucking around with them, teasing them, having a laugh, it turned into pickup. Because part of the teasing and the push pull and the and the like and the sexual and you and all that stuff, if you're good at it, the girl's then like, "Ooh, this guy's fun." Then she gives the number. Then you, so it leads to the. I wonder if you were like got into this stuff like ten years later, if you would have been a YouTuber. Uh, maybe you mean. I mean, I have videos on YouTube, but you mean like talking to the camera like this on YouTube? Yeah, yeah, like like a regular YouTube content like creator. Like just instead of like doing it for yourself and your friends, you would have just been making like infield YouTube videos and stuff like that. Like, I'm kind of lazy, and I mean, we did that eventually because there was money in it, and we made a lot of money on that. But uh, I, I I wasn't, I never was chasing celebrity. Like, look at me, I'm so great. I never was. In fact, when I had fanboys and stuff and people would come, it's, it kind of turned me off. It's like, dude, you know, because I, I wasn't like chasing the glow. Of oh, OK. Yeah, you, you and I are fundamentally different in that way. I love the validation I get from like the fanboys coming up and saying, you know, I love your content. I'm like, oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. So let, let me ask you this question. You kind of uh, were mentioning this earlier. You said that when you moved to New York, you had a, you made a series of changes and refinements and uh, that like, you know, made your uh, you know your game take off what specifically were those things that you started to change well there's a lot of them you'd have to read my i mean maybe you have read my book i mean they're all but I, i'll just highlight a couple i mean yeah, yeah. the 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 problem is i'm sure you know that when you're young and you're in an environment where there's a lot of hot girls that are also young and maybe they're they're not they're not mature enough to be looking for necessarily like they're not something long term people just want to have fun when they're young girls respond to um so basically the social script like the disney script is that you're supposed to whine and die. i used to do this too like take them out to dinner and be sweet and open doors and like all this kind of stuff but actually women generally especially young they don't respond well to that sexually they respond more to hard terms like telling them what like basically uh taking control of the situation and having a choreographed set of things you do to get the girl into an environment and aroused and focused and like t- moving towards a bedroom. Like mm-hmm. otherwise, if you just let, and I had, I had a lot of experience with this. If you just let the girl like dictate what you're going to do or how the date's going to go, you can go all over the place and it never could end up in bed and you can spend right. a lot of money. So I, I learned that you have to like shut the doors. Basically you have to like have quite a narrow, pathway and you also have to be very firm with your terms like if she doesn't comply to something i would just let her go but yeah. you, ha- you have to be in an environment where there's a lot of women yeah. and you also have to be like uh, sexually appealing like confident or handsome or a combination of those or what are charming so that the girls want your approval but but you have so- hard turns and some terms some girls will comply and others i mean it sounds harder than it is because if you turn them on they want to comply but I basically learned to, in a, in a nutshell, I learned to, t- I used to let things happen to me in dating and then I learned to take charge of it and it made all the difference. Yeah, that, that, that makes a lot of sense and that's very much in line with what I do. I'm okay with screening a whole bunch of girls out. I think that, you know, the quickest way to fail is to try to get with every girl and try to make it work with every girl. But yeah, like I have like a whole, like, you know, like a little, I don't know what we call it, like a ritual or a routine, whatever you want to call it, where basically like the girl for the date, for example, the girl's either going to come over or we're going to meet at a bar nearby. If the girl wants to meet halfway or she wants to meet at a bar near her place, 
I, you know, I just respectfully say, you know, no, like this is the offer. And a lot of times when you're pretty firm, the girl will actually go along with what you suggested. She'll see that like, okay, wow, this guy's interesting. He's not going to bend over backwards, right? It's like kind of his way or the highway a little bit. So mm -hmm. let me just go along with it, right? But if a girl's not willing to do that, I'm okay with letting her go. Like, I don't care because, yeah, there's like plenty of other girls out there. So, yeah, what you just said makes a lot of sense. And, yeah, of course, that would be definitely beneficial. Uh, what, what are some of the other ones? Uh, I just want to hear like a few more maybe that you like observed that were game changers for you. Um, I cut dinners out. Uh, so it was we just go straight to the lounge. And then eventually it was like straight back to my place. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Same. Um, I mean, basically making the interaction very – sexualized rather than like because i even though i i had a lot of experiences when i was because girls like me when i was young and and from very young like girls were interested in me and and i had a lot of opportunities where i'd end up like in a situation where there was no sexual tension we're both eating dinner or we're both like maybe watching a movie at a theater i mean that can be hot too if you're like making out but i i, I didn't realize that like I thought just spending time with a girl would advance the agenda and also too i mean i didn't have, when i was younger i didn't have the confidence i think most guys can't really, if you want to call it game, really can't get into game until their twenties or so. I mean, you'd have to be very mature to be like a sixteen-year-old guy with the confidence to like. Take yeah. Charge. I mean, most sixteen-year-old guys are just like figuring them themselves out and like their dick out and stuff. I mean, they're not really like uh, in, uh, super confident in charge of the situation. So I think you, it's it's those rare few guys in high school who do well, right? But most guys are sort of like awkward and pimply and all that. So I think you need to wait into your 20s and uh yeah i don't know where i'm kind of going on a tangent but no, the, it's born, yeah the anyhow so there's there i mean it's you're you're racking my brain for old stuff i mean i'm i'm so i'm kind of out of the pickup uh business yeah. no we'll, we'll get to all the new stuff i just kind of want to touch base yeah, on yeah. that as well uh but yeah we'll, we'll definitely get to your new stuff as well um uh, i guess like uh the follow-up question i would have to that is what um you you reached a certain level of celebrity whether you know you want it or not what was that turning point like how did you become paul janka the day game guy like what was was there like one thing that made that happen um well yeah i was on a big television show and a series of television shows so um with huge viewership and i was kind of defiant and cocky and stuff and so i was like the poster boy for this guy and i i knew what i was talking about i was living this life i mean the thing is why most guys don't get to a level where they're sleeping with hundreds of girls is that you have to have a very first of all you have to have the money or create a situation where you have a lot of free time to manage all these women and you also have to be in a city where there are a lot of women and it's fairly anonymous so they don't you can have hookups without because the big thing for women is social safety in other words they don't want their reputation Right. Like that's why New York's so good. Like it's so anonymous. So a girl can do what she likes right. on a Tuesday evening without it coming back to her. And maybe right. she has like a fancy job. She wouldn't want her, you know, her colleagues to know that she's behaved like that. But if you're in a smaller environment, like everyone knows each other's business. So you have to, you have to put yourself in a perfect environment and then you have to have the money or the time to not be in a job all the time and just work. It's very time consuming, isn't it? I mean, chasing yeah. tons of girls. So it is. I guess basically most guys don't have that situation. They have to work for a living. They have nine to fives. They don't, you know, they may not live in New York or they, whatever. So, um, yeah, I was, I think that's, I, I developed a set of skills that's quite unique. And then I was on TV talking about it. So people were like, oh, it also coincided with the, like the game and these mystery and all that stuff. That's true. Did you ever meet any of those guys? Like, did you guys ever uh, um, collab? No, not. I mean, some of them. Yeah, some of the some of the guys from the game I've met, and I'm I'm friends with one of them. Um, so so long ago, but yeah, there was a little bit of, and there were summits and stuff. I went to a few of those. I was, I mean, I was definitely like active in the scene. What once we started making money and and it was something to do, I uh, I got into it for a few years. I went to like conferences and all that, but. Then I met my girl girlfriend, who's now my wife. I moved to London, and I was focused mostly on making the money and and looking for other stuff. And and actually, the hard thing is getting out of this lifestyle, which yeah, is probably uh, the interesting thing to that, talk yeah. about. The yeah, yeah. like our mutual friend John Anthony and a lot of guys. I think what can happen is quite addictive. I think guys can end up in a bad situation. I, I was kind of like that too. You, if you get good at this, it's very hard to get off the merry-go-round. 
like who wants you know who wants one girl or like one itis on the other hand you can ruin your life if you just a friend of mine who who's a much older and didn't didn't grow up with like games so to speak he said the stupidest thing you can do is chase women your whole life because it's an it's a non-returning asset in a sense i mean it, it i remember distinctly getting out of this realizing like okay i've had 250 you know i've had a lot of fun like do i want to stay in another five years for an, an additional 250 girls that's a bit crude to say that but and i realized no it's kind of like smoking cigarettes after you smoke like 100 cigarettes the next 100 aren't as good and that you know it can it can kill you and it can take time so i think the hardest thing for guys who get good at it is trying to get out of the lifestyle and the constant validation and the sex addiction and the the excitement but if you don't, it's very hard to build a family life. It's very hard to build a different type of business. It's quite can be quite lonely. I mean, it's this very marginal type of lifestyle. I mean, most people by my age are in family environments, you know? Yeah, okay. That kind of leads us to the next topic. I mean, what, what, what was your main motivation for getting out of the game? Like, you just wanted a family? Was that kind of it? Or? Well, um, I always wanted... I was never one of these, I mean, some of my customers are like this, but I was never like a lifelong bachelor and I never kind of fell into that thing. I always imagine myself with a wife and kids. Mm. And um, I think the big thing that happened was that all my mates, my buddies fell away. I, I don't know if you see this happening now or not, but like <clears throat> when I was in New York in my late twenties, I, I, I had all my running mates, but then I had the girls, but I would see my buddies for steak on Thursday. We'd smoke a cigar. We'd go to the movies sometimes. Like I had a lot of camaraderie with my buddies right. and they were the constant, like they were like, Oh, good new. Or like if I did well at work, whatever it was, it was like, they were, they were my support network and the girls were disposable. The girls were just for fun, you know? Right. And the problem is the guys started to fall off the, off the shelf because they got married. They moved to the suburbs they weren't available. You, I don't know if you're experiencing this now, but when you start dealing with married men, my uh, friends are all degenerate, so not not uh, yet. Okay, well that has a that's a different problem. <laughs> but um, if if um, you know married guys, like good friends of mine, get married, I couldn't see them that often. They're like, yeah, I'll see you in a month. You know, yeah, I've got know. work, I've got two kid, infant children, my wife, like the in laws are coming. They, so all my good friends didn't weren't available that often, and they moved right. away. So I was like. I traded all these like but mostly like college and, and lifelong buddy friends for like a rat pack of sort of motley crew. One guy had a patch, one guy had a parrot, he's like rah, rah, rah. One, guy, <laughs> one guy had a one guy had a cane, was limping. You start to see that the yeah. guys who are out there become weirder and weirder and more and more like there's like there's like a clown on the unicycle <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So I was like, I better fucking get hey, Paul, out you want to pick up some girls? <laughs> I was like, I better get out of this before I fucking become one. Of these <laughs> so it was that. And um, I was also, I had had so, so much success for so long. I was kind of tired of it. It was like, it was fun. There's always the thrill, but the diminishing returns. I wrote something called Tom, Top 10 Reasons to Get Out of the Game. One of them was that, uh, like, sleep. You know, you get STDs occasionally. I was getting like no sleep because you're either waiting for a girl to show up or having sex. Like my sleep schedule was shit. Um, there was a whole bunch of reasons. Mm. And um, also I wanted to start doing stuff with a partner, like travel. I was making money. I wanted to travel the world. I wanted to make memories. You can't make memories with like a hood rat. You know, you just, she just comes over and like, I, I didn't want her to meet, you know, so you, the problem with disposable women is you can't do much with them. Um, but I wanted to, so that was happening and all my buddies were, were getting into these family pods and I was, the writing was on the wall. I was like, am I going to do this? Cause you can do it later in New York. I mean, guys stay single until their forties and fifties, but I was like, is, is the next 10 years of this lifestyle as good as the last 10 years? And I was like, no way it's time to get no. out. Let me so ask I, you. Okay. I was, I was like, I had my radar up and then when I, you know, I was still dating girls, but I met a girl who's now my wife and she like ticked all the boxes and I was like, this is a good off ramp. So, Plus, we were like really, you know, I was really keen on her, and I had a lot of. I started, I fell in love with her basically. But there, I was open to that because I was ready to get out of that lifestyle. But the thing is, it's quite. It was very difficult to sort of like keep the tiger in the cage. I mean, I had to like. Yeah, I get yeah. It. yeah, yeah. Let me ask you a hypothetical. What if um, all your friends, like your good friends, not like the monthly crew of weirdos, uh, like your good friends, they none of them were getting married. Like they all stayed single, and. 
and furthermore, let's what if uh, you were living in a little bit of a different era where you didn't have to actually sacrifice your sleep? Uh, let's say like you got like a really good Instagram, like you were low key Dan Bilzerian and you were just getting girls with like minimal effort, right? Like girls were down. And furthermore, let's say you had like a few cool girls on rotation that were down to travel with you and that you like. Do you think if all if the, all those things were like that, do you think you still would have gone out, uh, quit the game or do you think maybe that would have been a game changer? I mean, I, I, it wasn't, it wasn't so black and white. I mean, I had a little bit, bit of what you're describing. I had a, a pretty easy funnel for girls. I, I still did have some friends who, but it, a lot of the quality made, I mean, most, I hate to say this, but I think it's true. Most solid quality guys settle down pretty early. They've got serious jobs that they want education. They want a family. They want to, they want to build it. And, and, I think guys who stay single have stay single because psychologically there's something that they haven't fixed in themselves generally. So I, I think it's the same with women, women who are single at 35, there's issues with that. So I, I think that's part of the, the reason. Also, I wanted children. So okay. what yeah. you described there is also the biggest the, factor. It's not really conducive to children, Dan Blazarian or whatever. I mean, yeah, I think that's the biggest factor out of everything you mentioned is that you wanted children. Uh, you can't really have like, yeah, that's that's one thing you can't like fix with any of the whatever the hypotheticals I mentioned. Uh, yeah, and, and also, like a good family you need to have like a you know a partner, right? Like you can't just do it with like a random chick. I mean, Mystery tried that, and he's divorced and has no custody and stuff like. I mean, I think it's very dangerous to start having children unless you unless you're in a pro in proper relationship yeah I, I I, yeah we agree on that yeah no i agree with yeah. you on that uh the, the other thing too is guys there's a myth that men have all the time in the world but you don't actually have as much time as you think if you want a normal life like for example yeah, i agree with you on that too yeah yeah like my I, my daughter is five four and a half and she saw my father once we went to the states but he died he passed away after he saw her when she was eight months like I, I cherish that. And now my mother's very sick. She has serious cancer. She'll I'm probably sorry. pass away soon. And she's had some time with my daughter, but hasn't seen her grow up. So the reality is like older men, it, it, when talking about game, it's like, who cares? But it, this is an important thing when you're a family man. It's like, do, do your parents get to see your child grow up? Yeah, no, I, I think you're right about that. And I agree with you. There's this, there's this myth. It's more in the red pill community uh, that like, oh, you're a man, you know, you hit your prime in your 40s, 50s, and then age like fine wine. But yeah, if you're like, you know, you don't want to be like by the time your kid is a teenager, you're 70 years old. You can't like play with your kid. You'll never meet your grandkids. Like that's sad. Like, yeah, like my dad, like I'm very thankful for the fact that my dad, my parents had me young. So like my dad is still, in, my parents are both in their 50s. So I still have oh, a wow. long time left with my family, right? Another 30, 40 years, right? Like versus if they had me when they were in their fifties, like by now they would be on their deathbed, which would be like very sad. So yeah, I see your point. Like, I think that's- uh, Yeah, my father had me when he was 40. And so he was 82 when he died and he, um, I was 42 when LMA was born. So it was like, he got to see her once, but you know, he never got, he loved skiing. He never got to ski with her. Like there, there's so many things that these are things you don't see when you're out in the game, but these right. are realities about the lane stuff. Also, it's like my wife is 13 years younger, which is great because, you know, she's got a lot of energy. She looks, you know, younger women tend to look better. You know, they, they, right. everyone as they age. They, and she's fertile for like, we can, we're thinking about having a second kid. We didn't have to rush into it. But the reality is if you wait long, like if you're 50, you could be a bachelor till you're 50, but then it's like, okay, what if you do decide you want children, then you have to find a wife and then she's probably in a rush, right? She's like, unless you get, a, I mean, unless you get a really young girl, but that's. I think that's you know, problematic in of itself for a long-term relationship. Where yeah, and also you have different interests too. I mean, yeah, and you're going to be old and she's going to be in middle age. I mean, the, the, the classic thing that's that comes up a lot is like guys in their 40s who are like, I'm going to bang a 23-year-old, fine, but she's out at the club, you know, get, getting drunk and high and comes in at three and you're like trying to read the economist and you have a big conference call at like at nine in the morning. So it's, a, it's like, can be a compatibility, a lifestyle. Yeah, no, no, I, I see, I see your point on that. Yeah. Like if we're banging, it doesn't matter, but yeah, for like, if you want to get into a serious relationship, if you're a guy who's in his late forties, I think it's like kind of bizarre to get into a serious relationship with a chick who's in her twenties. Cause like the, the interests are going to be so different. Like, I think like a 10 year age gap is like fine and natural. Like if you're, 
like in your 40s and she's in her like mid 30s then like okay there's compatibility there but she's also younger right so you kind of get to uh get the best of both worlds yeah. but when the age gap becomes more than like 15 20 years then it just becomes bizarre because you're too different like even me i'm 32 i hook up with like 18 19 year old girls sometimes and sometimes i'll be laying in bed and i'll just be thinking like i remember i had this epiphany like four or five months ago i was hooking up with this like 18 year old chick and i was like holy shit we literally are living on different planets like she's telling me about like yeah so on tiktok i just i'm like what the fuck are like we're not even like the same species like you know like yeah this chick is hot but like like I could not date her. We have we have nothing in common at all. Like we're just living such different lifestyles, and that's not even that big of an age gap. That's like I don't know, fourteen years, fifteen years. So uh, I do think the age gap narrows as you get older. So I think, for example, uh, a guy who's in his forties would have more in common with a girl in her thirties than a guy who's in his thirties who would have more in common than a girl in her late teens. Yeah, that yeah. sounds reasonable. The um, so basically because. I learned a lot in my transition. I, I made a couple of products. One's called Playboy to Papa because I used to be a player and now I'm a father. Playboy to Papa, <laughs> and also Decision Note Theory. And actually, I'm I'm, I'm running this retreat in the winter in Miami to take guys because a lot of the coaching I do now is guys a little older than you, like 37, and they've got a girlfriend. They've been with her a couple of years. They feel like they're settling. She's maybe not as dynamic or hot. Whatever. There's some reason hot is hot or whatever. She doesn't have come from money or. And they have an itch to play the field more and they they want a lot of my coaching is about what should i do now like coming into my 40s like should i cut her and go for on a rampage should i settle down what is like for example people don't necessarily so i try to coach like because i'm on the other side i've been married for some right. years like one of the things that guys don't realize is you know you get the you marry the family so i got i deal with the in-laws the in-laws come and stay with us so all of a sudden you're this player and now you got this girl and now her, her dad's in your house and like mom and like it, it's like but what you said is true i think the, i have some friends who are like inveterate bachelors they've refused to settle down and they basically either have clipped their they've gotten their testes clip whatever what's it called um history oh, what's it called what's that can yeah yeah sorry just like or they say they don't want kids and i think if you it's a bit nuts to be sure of that but if you're if you're absolutely certain you don't want children then then maybe there's no reason to i i don't think there's any reason to go along with anyone you can just have like you know medium-term girlfriends and rotate it out yeah that, that, that makes sense so let's kind of get into what you're doing now so um it, I, that's a very interesting thing that you brought up so for a guy in that situation uh, who's like, yeah, you know, I have a relationship, but maybe I can do better. I sort of want to play the field. Like, what kind of advice would you give them? Well, it's more, it's not so much advice, but I just talk through things that, like, this, that, that they may not be thinking about. Like, um, also how your libido, my libido's drop tremendously. Yeah. Like, right. I think my value in helping these guys is that I'm 10 years down the line and I can tell them what it's like. First of all, marriage is not about sex, obviously. Like, right. Uh, I, even you guys, you and John Anthony probably have the experience that when you're with a girl for a few weeks or months, the tension drops off. Like you might be like jumping on her bones the first week or two. Well, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. right. Well, that, that of course carries off into marriage. So you should, one thing I talk about is character versus cosmetics. A lot of young guys are so into the cosmetics of the girl. Oh, she's got big tits. She's got full lips. Great. At, that's fine. Whatever you should. I think if, if you're still in that stage where that's, the whole does it for you. That's the whole thing. You should stay single and just consume that. Like I, I agree better. with you on that. Yeah. I but agree. once you start looking for a partner, because when you marry someone, you're marrying your finances, you're marrying everything. It's a you know, um, you, you should care. This is obvious, maybe to some people, but character is the most important. Is she honest? Is she hardworking? Is she responsible? Like a lot of hot chicks are totally irresponsible. And if you were to ever have a kid with someone like that or married, they would totally sink your ship. Their yeah. shit is so out of hand. It's yeah. like, so you have to be, you have to develop. But well, I think that stuff may sound obvious to you and I, but I think it's not obvious to a lot of people. I see a lot of people doing the opposite of what you're saying, which is marrying a chick for looks. Be like, yo, bro, this one had the biggest tits. I'm like, all right, but like, and that marriage lasts like one year, and then she like completely fucks him over, and that stuff like blows my mind. And I see this happen. We're not even talking to dumbasses. We're talking about successful, usually intelligent guys who make great decisions, make the worst decisions when it comes to marriage, and they pick the worst girl for them. In in terms of looks, she's great, but in terms of everything else, she's horrible. And then their their mind is blown when they get fucked over. Yeah, it, I, I I've seen that as well. It's it, it's a bit crazy. I mean, the thing. There's a couple of things to realize about marriage too, or long-term cohabit, especially with a kid. It's like, um, first of all, the reality is once you 
settle down with someone, and especially when you have a family, your, your life becomes quite small. I mean, I was just traveling the U.S. with my wife and kid and saw tons of, we drove from North Carolina up to Boston for my college reunion, and we saw we were in New York, and I mean, it was great, but you travel as a pack. I mean, I see my wife all day, all the time. I see my right. daughter. All, and so this is the person you're going to see the most for many, many, many years. So it's like the most important decision you can possibly, more important than your career in many ways, like the woman you choose. So when you, I think a lot of guys who are good at game and they're banging a lot of chicks that they haven't, it's impossible for them to think about a long-term investment in a girl versus because they've been so conditioned to make all these short-term investments. So they, part of what I teach and my, and I, I have books and stuff like that and, 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 and little essays and, and products. It's about explain, first of all, what makes a good girl a good girlfriend is generally not what makes someone a good wife. It's a different set of criteria. Can, can you talk about that as well? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, what, what's good for a wife, hot cosmetics, a little bit, it's not wife for a girlfriend. She looks great. She's a little bit wild and crazy, maybe a little bit unpredictable maybe even keeps you a bit jealous so that you're on your game like you you're, you're pining after her all the time Ooh. she's um if you're the big daddy you're taking charge of the stuff in the dating so you you don't care that she's responsible because you're like i'm taking you out to dinner i'm taking you i'm flying you down to bahamas for the week and i'm in charge so like her ability to look after herself is like not of not of consequence and also um excitement right that's what you want a girlfriend all that and a wife is totally different unless you're unless you have probably over 10 or 50 million dollars most people even upper middle class they need to count on each other as partners so it's someone once said it's great a marriage is sort of like a running a small nonprofit. it's like who's doing the laundry who's getting the kid have you paid the rent it's like accounting and stuff like that and it's, it's not sexy and you have to um you should think about the girl as a business partner so it's different like the criteria for a wife is like is she honest is she responsible does she lead? Are her habits healthy? You know, I, I remember a number of hot chicks I've been, they might have been like 19, 20. It's great figures, big tits, all just sexy as hell. And then I would see what they would put in their face, what they would eat Kentucky Fried Chicken, Twinkies. And I'm like, oh, you can get away with it now, but in 40 years, that's going to look, you know, that type of lifestyle behavior looks, or same with smoking, for example, all these things. So the thing is, the whole point is that youth masks a lot of shit, right? When you're young, you yeah. can do a lot of stuff without consequence. All this shit catches up with you in your 30s and 40s and 50s. And you want to pick someone. You want to be able to see see the girl when she's young and say, okay, she's got none of this fucking shit baggage that's going to fuck me. Yes. So I've talked about a, a few of the things. But it's but the thing is, you can bang those chicks all day long, but don't bring them into the, on board the ship, you know, bang them, bang them off ship. So to speak. You, you know what's interesting about what you said? So a lot of the qualities you ascribe to a wife are actually things that I personally ascribe to a girlfriend. Uh, I've never been married, really? but I, I have a girlfriend right now. And pretty much okay. all those things line up with what I look for in a girlfriend, what my girlfriend has. Right. So I would never consider dating a girl who's not responsible, who's not honest, who's not ethical, who's not loyal. Uh, for me, like uh, one of the things you mentioned, you might want a girl who makes you a little bit of jealous. That would be like an instant deal breaker for me uh, when it comes to a girlfriend, uh, because I, you know, I hate playing stupid games. Right. So like my girlfriend. Well, now, let me clarify. Let me clarify that quickly because I think I missed. Not that she, not she intentionally makes you jealous, but like a girl who's who's just so sexy that she's provocative, like other men are hitting on her and all that stuff. And, and you're like, oh, wow, that's my girl. And then you take her. Like, mm. I don't think that's ideal for a wife setup because that that could stoke a lot. You, I mean, I'm not saying you don't want an attractive wife, but not a girl who purposely dresses in yeah. a way to, to get male attention, basically. I would argue that you don't want that in a girlfriend either because right? Because then if she's purposely dressing, then she's like, you know, like, like my girlfriend certainly doesn't do that. And if she did, that would be problematic. Like, you know, not that she can't dress sexy, but if I got, if I found out that she's dressing sexy to get attention from other men, that would be a very big discussion, if not potentially <laughs> the end of the relationship, right? Because that's like, that's just like something I really like. Well, that's good for you. Maybe you're ready to... Um... Maybe you're ready to, I mean, maybe she's a keeper then, this one. It's just, <laughs> it's just that um, cert, my criteria for sleeping with girls, I mean, when you sleep with hundreds of women, it, criteria, I didn't screen for character. I guess my, my point is- I see what you're saying though. Yeah. I, didn't scream for, I didn't scream for character. I just screened for girls who would be fun in the sack and, and like right. provocative and stuff. And then I did, have, I mean, I've had serious girlfriends over the years and a lot of them were solid girls. I was too young to settle. I mean- there's an old saying that says a guy settles down when he's ready. A girl settles down when she meets the right guy. I, I think that's a bit sexist, but I think there's some truth to that. Like 
you could have presented me with the best woman when I was younger. I hadn't got it through my system. I had yeah, same, same. I was ready at, at I got married at 40, you know, I had my daughter at 42. I was ready to settle down in my late 30s, uh, but not before then. Yeah, that, that makes total sense. Yeah, it has to be at the right time. Yeah, like for sure. If you would have presented me with my current girlfriend when I was in mid twenties, there's there's no chance we would have had any kind of relationship. So yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I guess my question, follow up question, would be this: uh, you know, like nowadays, a lot of guys are like, you know, they want to get married, but they're paranoid about getting fucked over, right? You hear a lot of those stories. Yeah, it's really scary. I mean, why? Here's the question: because you're younger, do yeah. you guys really want to get married? I mean, and one. On one hand, you could say that's an old institution. It's bullshit. Why why do that? Let's just like, you know, polygamy or have casual relationships. The problem is, I think, is that when you want to have children, it gets very messy without well, I think that's what it is. A lot of men want to have children and they they want to do it in either, you know, in a committed relationship, you know, ideally with a wife. So I think it, why do we, well let's talk, let's unpack that just for a second. Why do yeah. men want to get married? Well, I, th I think I mean, sorry, that, why do men want to have children? I think it's biological, honestly. I think like you have this biological impulse to pass your seed. Me personally, I never had that. I never cared about having kids. Uh, but like they also, I think it's socially conditioned, like their parents did, their grandparents did it. And uh, I think also, I mean, there's an element of like, yeah, I can see the point. Like when you get old and you're like, you know, you're like in your 70s and all your friends are no longer around. And it's like, it's nice to have someone there who's like, you know, there for you. Right. So I, I see, I see that argument. Don't you want to carry on the family name? Like the, all the greatness that you are in somebody else's gene? Or do you think like these are- well, What if my kids are shitheads? I don't, don't want to pass this the family name. What if my kids are just complete, like, I don't know, losers? You know, it's interesting, actually. This is definitely not PC and like no, pretty, go for pretty aggressive, but I was watching that show, which is so shitty, but it's somehow addictive. Selling Sunset. Have you seen that? No. That's it on Netflix. Anyhow, it's about real, super ridiculously like flashy, hot real estate agents in, the, in LA. And, and, and there's these two super short guys that are quite successful financially. And they, they didn't want to have, in the end, this one guy decided he went right up to the brink with this girl, but decided he didn't want to have kids and pulled out. He's older to it. And I think about my, one of my business partners has diabetes and he doesn't want to have that type one doesn't want to have children. And then I, I another friend who's emotionally a little bit fucked up I mean, more, a little bit more than normal. Maybe he doesn't want to, I kind of feel like men sometimes when they, when they realize that they're damaged or they have some either biologic or they have it, I think they, in a way, they self-preserve, and they're like, you know what? I don't want to, I don't want to bestow this on my can on my progeny. So I'm going to cut it here. I'm going to cut the lineage. I'm just going to put a, a line under this, and this mm. this you DNA sequence is like conscious level or something. Yeah, yeah, or conscious. But it's interesting because most of the healthy, uh, uh, reasonably well-adjusted folks I know, men have gone on to have kids and several kids and all that, and the ones that are there's something holding them back. It, it's either psychological damage or, or biological disease or something. They don't, and they know like I, it's life has been tough to me. I don't want to do this for a kid. So since I that's what I've observed. Interesting. Yeah. You know, I would say I've almost observed the opposite where I've noticed a whole bunch of people having kids who I don't think should have kids. <laughs> all kinds of fucked up. And I'm like, dude, like you're, you're bringing a child into this. Like, geez, Louise, like you thought with all the issues you have that having it, throwing a few kids in the mix would be the solution. Like that's the opposite of what you should be doing, man. That's uh, interesting. On the other hand, I, I do agree with you. I mean, I mean, not, not, not that point necessarily, but it is funny is that you, you, you you're never quite ready. I mean, some guys wait because they, think like I'm not ready. I have to have all my shit perfectly, all my T's crossed, all my I's dotted. And there's not really a time. There's not really a perfect time. There's always some problem in your life, you know, and actually middle age, which you're, you and John Anthony aren't at yet is, is a tough period because like your parents are dying or generally you're, you're, so you're next in line to go off the cliff that, you know, when your parents are alive, there's a more more out mortality buffer. Like they, you know, like first the grandparents die. I mean, if there's no tragedy, then the parents. Then, but now it's like I can see the abyss, and so it's really nice to have children and and to think about the lineage carrying on because I can look to the future in my daughter. And not to mention, I have a ton of fun. I'm very we're very blessed because our daughters have made so much fun and all this stuff. But um, the the yeah, when you're middle age is tough because your parents you're looking after your folks in some, one way or another, looking after your children. And you're trying to earn enough money and manage a household. This is like the hardest period. So mm -hmm. I, I think back to my time when I was your age or a little younger. I had it like 
had no responsibility really. And I just had nonstop girls and like money in the bank. It was like blissful, but I'm also glad I, I don't, that's the problem with life and why that's what I try to coach, why it's so hard. Like you can figure it all out in your early thirties and have a incredibly optimized situation. But the problem is that doesn't travel well 10 years forward. That same set of infrastructure doesn't work at 40. Like you have to constantly re readjust every, yeah. that's my yeah. opinion. I agree with you on that. I mean, I guess the best argument I've ever heard for having children actually came from my cousin. Uh, my, like my female cousin, we're like very close. We grew up together, like practically like my sister and she, you know, she had kids a few years ago and we were kind of like discussing cause you know, like, okay, what's, what's your life now? Like having kids. And she said something very interesting that I've never heard anyone say, but like really made sense to me. She's like, you know, when you're a kid and you're like five, six, seven years old and you go to the ocean or you do something and it's just like such a, such an immersive experience, meaning like you're so present with something so basic, like something so basic, like going to the playground or going to the ocean makes you so happy. She's like, you know how that goes away like later on in life when you're yeah. an adult, you don't experience that. She said, well, when you have a kid, you get to relive all those things through your kids. So she's like, it's basically in a way like me being a kid again. And it's like, like a second life. Yeah, it is. Yeah, she, she was like saying, she's like, you know, going to the ocean hasn't been like exciting for me in 20 years, right? It's just whatever because I've seen every ocean. Like she's traveled across the world. But now that I go with my daughter, Layla, right? And she sees the ocean. I get to see it through her eyes and I get to have that immersion experience, which I found really interesting. Like that's the one argument I've never heard before. But I found that pretty, uh, pretty interesting. Like, you know, how like that's a potential tangible benefit that you could get like right away from having kids. Uh, did you ever experience anything like that? Yeah. I mean, all the time, every day. We, I just was watching Encanto, which is a Disney movie. And my daughter was dancing and I was dancing and, and the music is so cool. And I was just, she's enraptured by the stuff and right. frozen. And so am I like, or we can go to the zoo or we can get ice cream. Or like, like she was in New York City for the first time looking at the Empire State Building. And I was like, I mean, it's impressive anyhow. He's an adult. But it was just like, it was, I mean, yeah, if you have a, if, if you have a health, I mean, the thing, if you have a healthy child, sometimes some people, their children are not healthy. And that's so difficult, you know. Yeah. But, but if you have a healthy kid and you have your relationship with your partner is, is workable and you're not in like, you know, you're not in poverty or whatever, I think. You can have a ton of fun with children. I mean, because exactly, they have fresh eyes. They have, they have. It's also super hard raising kids. But in, in, I have a friend just had a. He's in his forties, just had an infant. She's like, he's like dying because you're so tired. You're they're they're up every three hours or whatever. But um, right now, once you get over the hurdle of the first three years, like these are great years because it's so fun. We're making memories all the time and and just having so much fun. And uh, those you know, kids will say stuff and you didn't know they they knew that word or how to say that. <laughs> No, it's cool. It's definitely because yeah, adults you get, pick up me. <laughs> the uh, the um, what does getting bitches mean? <laughs> that's right. The um, you know, adults get jaded, right? And so, yeah, oh, like, totally, dude. Yeah, I, sad, I, I would, I would give all my money if I could go back to the kind of like optimistic, go lucky attitude I used to have when I was like a kid. I mean, like, yeah, I mean, I could be so happy with just something so basic versus now it's like, all right, like I need this, 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 and this, and this, and maybe I'll get like 20% of the happiness. Uh, so here, I, just here's a question for you: Is you, you have a girlfriend and you're doing this pickup thing? So you, I guess you have one foot out of the lifestyle already, right? Or how does that work? Well, it's a it's a one way open relationship, so I can hook up with other girls, yeah. uh, and you know I do that fairly often. Uh, so I wouldn't say like having a girlfriend has for me given that relationship. How did you find a girl like that that's up up for that? Uh, w what do you mean? Uh, uh, letting you have that. Because generally women aren't aren't keen on that, but you've yeah. obviously found one who's agreed to that. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I I don't know. I've never. I, I'm not a believer in that personally, but it's interesting. You've made it. It sounds like you've made it work. How did you? How did you find a girl who you knew would be cool with that? Yeah, or there's no. Yeah, there's an element of luck to that. I mean, like, it's not like I, I can't say like, oh, I can make this work with every girl. Some chicks are just not going to be down with that, no matter how well you present it. Uh, I did a video all talking about this like uh, a few weeks ago. But basically, the big things I said was, uh, one, you need, a, you need a girl who's not jealous and who's pretty open minded. Uh, so this will not work with a jealous. And my girlfriend is like the least jealous human being ever. Like, I couldn't make her jealous even if I tried. She's just like very non-jealous. I'm also very non-jealous, so that kind of works well. Uh, also, she's pretty open-minded. 
Um, I think another one is there needs to be a big level of investment. So we were like hooking up for like over a year before we started dating. So I wasn't just like, I think like, you know, if you, on the second or third date with a girl, you're like, Hey, I want a one way open relationship. The girl's just going to laugh in your face. But if you guys have known each other for a year and she's really invested in you, she's going to be more likely to consider it and go along with it. I think another one is you need to have some level of rules. So it's not like a total free for all. It's not like I can just do whatever I want, right? Like if I start going on dates or trips with like other other girls, you know, that's going to be violating the rules of our relationship, right? So it's not like a total free for all, like we have some ground rules in place, you know, that work for her work for me. Uh, so I think yeah, like, let me ask are- you this question. I mean, the obvious answer is because guys have testosterone, you would but what, why do you feel you need that extra outlet? Uh, because I know myself really well at this point, And I know that uh, I need the variety and the novelty. And if I don't uh, have that, I will start to build resentment for my girlfriend. And then one of two things is going to happen. Either it's going to come to a breaking point, I'm going to cheat, or I'm going to want to break up with her, uh, whether I'm conscious of it or not. And I've had that happen in the past where, like, I had great girlfriends. I got into a monogamous relationship. And then all these opportunities would present themselves to hook up with another girl. I would turn down those opportunities. And every time I did that, the resentment built and built for my girlfriend. And my girlfriend didn't do anything wrong. She's being a great girlfriend. But I found myself six months later, I'm at a place where I'm resenting her for, like, ruining all these things that I want to do for me. Right? And that's not fair to her, you know. And then sometimes I would either cheat, which, you know, obviously I'm not a fan of. I think that's messed up. Uh, but when I was younger, you know, I did have a few situations where I cheated on my girlfriend. Or, you know, I was just like so fed up that like I was looking for excuses to exit out of the relationship. So maybe one small little fight and I'm already like trying to like bounce. Right. But that's not because of the fights, because of all the resentment that's been built up. So at this point, I'm just like, yeah, I'm, unless that desire naturally goes away, then like that's the only type of question I'm going to do. Because, you know, I don't want to be in a situation where I have to like cheat on my girlfriend, where I have to build resentment. Um, yeah. I no, guess it I'm, sounds like you've thought about it and worked out. Do you, what, what you personally, what you're, you're 32. How old are you? Yeah, I'm 32. So what, like, where do you see yourself in 40 and do you want children? Not really. I'm not ruling it out. Like I haven't gotten a vasectomy or anything because I think it's a possibility. I'm, I'm open to the idea that my mindset will change because I'm not the same person I was in my 20s, right? So logically, that suggests that I'm not going to be the same person I am in my 40s, right? So in my 40s, my mindset could completely change and I could want children, right? So I don't want to right, right. cross that bridge off and just say, no, it's never going to happen based on my mindset now. Uh, but at this point in time, I have no desire to have children. So it, it's zero desire or it's some desire, but the, the negatives outweigh the positive. No, it's, 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 like there's no, why would I want that? It, it's, it's interesting you say that. Cause when I was 32, I didn't have any like paternal instinct. I got, I got super, you know what the word broody means? It might be an English word, but it's like, mm-hmm. uh, in, like a British word. But broody means like you really want, you, you really craving having kids. And like before uh, my wife got pregnant, I was like, I was like, oh, this kid's so cute. My wife was like, you cannot just steal babies. Like, I was like, I was in a mode where I like biologically was like, I could feel that I wanted to have an offspring. And, um, but at your age, that was, it's, I have to remember like 32 was, um, oh, hold on. I could tell you what year that is. 32 was, so 30 was two, yeah, 2007. I was like in the thick of it. I was fucking slaying and banging hardcore the kids. I would have like laughed you to the bank though. I would have been like, what? I mean, I, 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 kids at the moment, I always thought like eventually I'd probably settle down, but it was like the farthest thing from my mind. So it's weird how men change or human beings yeah. change. Yeah. Yeah. I'm definitely open to the idea that, uh, yeah, I mean, what you're saying makes sense. Like I, I, I wouldn't, let's just put it this way. I wouldn't be surprised that if in my forties, my mindset changes and I actually start really wanting kids like that wouldn't be like, you know, surprising because that's the trajectory that a lot of other men have followed. Like not just you, there's been a lot of other sure, stories yeah. I've heard of guys who could care less about having kids when they were younger and then they got older and then like their mindset changed. Uh, like for example, when I was in my twenties, I could care less about building like meaningful relationships, whether it's with friends or whatever. Like I just want to have fun versus now like relationships are very important to me. Right. So I like, I'd rather, if my choice is banging a new girl or getting dinner with an old friend, I will pick like, you know, the dinner, right. Versus 10 years ago it would have been different. It would have been banging the girl. Mm-hmm. So definitely things like that change uh, for sure. Um, I guess like the, the follow-up question I had that I wanted to ask was uh, kind of what we were saying earlier. So, you know, there's there's a lot of guys who want to have kids, right? I think that's not – that's very common. They see themselves having kids, but they're worried. Oh, they're worried about, about – yeah, yeah. yeah. What, what, so what are like some advice you would give for them? Like what do you think they can do? Um, 
Well, I think there's there are five stages you need to pass through before you get married, like the alt before you get to the altar. We can go talk about this in a second, but um, I think you need to have uh, a long screening process. Like you have to know what to screen for in the girl. Also, it's not just about the girl. You also have to be ready because it's quite challenging, especially when kids come along. Like I've had to revise some of my egocentric uh, points of view and stuff. Like I, mm. I used to, every time I would argue with my wife when I was younger, I, or I would always thought I'm right. And I'm just going to like, maybe we'd stop arguing because we got tired of arguing. But, mm-hmm. but now I'm actually often kind of afterwards thinking like, fuck, yeah, she's right. Like I was, I can't believe I dug my heels into that. So that's caught. That's, there's a lot of, it's not, it's a bit humiliating or hu- humbling, but it's, um, there's been a lot of ego development or basically not been so egotistical. And, and um, I don't know how I got on that, but that, that I've had, to, I've had to change quite a bit, but also you have to screen for the right girl and ha- have a, an effective screening process. I also think guys, like, I think I played it. I was lucky. I played it kind of well. Like my, I met my wife when she was 21 and I was 34 or something like that. So she was very young. Um, she wasn't a stranger to guys though. I mean, she was quite flirty and, and developed. So she had, she wasn't like a total innocent. So she had some, um, well, the reason I say that is because, uh, she wasn't, she wasn't like, um, out of the nunnery. Like she, I, when I met her, right, right. I, 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 I mean, it's, it's sounding the wrong way that I want to say it. What I want no, to say I is that what you're getting at. Yeah. she, she had, she, she could carry herself well. And she was like a woman basically. Right. She wasn't like a, and, um, so, so although she's 21, she's not as young as some other 21s in mindset and all that. And so, and I was 34 and that was a good spread because we could, we dated and traveled and lived together for years, traveled the world, went to safari, went to Cuba, I mean, Bahamas. We traveled and traveled Asia, China, the, without the burden of children and like all that. And then we had a long courtship and then we got married and, and, so we had a lot of time and, and, and she didn't have a biological clock ticking. So she, so one of the points is you have to choose wisely because you, you, you don't want any time you put pressure on a relationship is bad. And like one of the key pressures is a guy who's 37 meets a 33 year old girl. And she's like, I have to get fucking have a kid next year. And it's right, like, right. that's unworkable. Man. Right. So that's, that's one thing. Um, and the guy also has to be ready. I think he has to have mastered. This is me this is something I read years ago that actually got me into game a little PDF. But one of the things that it said, was that you have to master short term recreational relationships, which I did. I nailed it. I totally mastered it before you get into a long term committed is a very different things. And so uh-huh. sometimes guys get married and they haven't played the field successfully enough. So they're uh-huh. full of regrets. That's the worst type of guy. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. I agree. A guy that. who's like 45 and like yeah, he's a little yeah. out of shape. His wife's put on weight. They have two kids, and like yeah, yeah. he's like, "Fuck, I never fucked." Yeah, that's my that's so sad. Yeah, twenty year olds. I mean, just you, you got to plow through a lot of hot chicks and get <laughs> yeah, that out of your system. Yeah, and so you're not mesmer. Yeah, I still look at girls, but I've already every type of hot girl I could possibly see. I've I've fucked several versions of that yeah, girl. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, I'll take a look, but I can leave it alone because I know what that's about. Whereas a guy who doesn't know, he's he, he'll sacrifice his wife and his kid and his family, for right. like that, which is crazy. I think that's a. I think that's probably one of the biggest things what you just said right there. I think. I think. Uh, yeah, like especially, I think a lot of guys get into relationships and marriage uh, largely for pussy. Like, like when you that's ask like them, backwards. I heard a great quote. I read a great. He said. Marrying a, marrying a girl for sex is like buying a 747 airplane for the free peanuts. It's like, in other words, it's like you're, it's the totally wrong thing. Like right. you no, I, 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 I agree with you, but it happens all the time, unfortunately. Uh, yeah. Like, yeah. So I think another big thing is getting, uh, picking from a place of abundance. So meaning yeah, like exactly. you've been with hundreds of girls. So you ha- you you're picking from abundance versus picking from scarcity. You're going to make a completely different uh, decision and you're way more likely to overlook red flags. If you're picking from scarcity. Exactly. Yeah. She only hit me that one time. She doesn't beat me that often or like, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, sure. She shoplifts, but she never steals anything over a thousand dollars. Like, you know, you find, you start making these weird rationalizations when you're in scarcity, uh, which you don't make. abundance. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's uh that's key. Let me ask you this question. Uh, you know, a lot of guys nowadays, like who are looking for like something more serious, they're they, you know they find themselves going overseas to like Eastern Europe or South America because they're like, yeah, you know, uh, women there, you know, they're more feminine, they're more family oriented. What do you think about something like that? That's probably true. I mean, 
the traditional societies which were patriarchal i mean the most extreme is the middle east right where the girls can't even get a job or can't drive like in yeah, if you right. if you want if you want a really fucking compliant girl go to saudi arabia they should yeah. like, raise her voice like, and yeah. she, she has to beg you to like you know get get you know you, she's like a child you have to drive her to the yeah, that seems kind of miserable to me but yeah no no i know but that's the extreme and yeah, then yeah. On the other extreme, you have like American and like Western, you're like British women right. and Amer Western who are very independent and outspoken. And like, I'm a, I'm a woman, hear me roar. I'm not going to take shit from you. That, that right. also can be like that. So, but I think like everything in life is a trade off. If you want my two cents, the more traditional places, yes, the women are more subservient. They hold, they respect the man and all that, but they're also, in some ways, not fully actualized women, they, they, because they've been limited. So you're dealing with someone who's perhaps boring, perhaps frustrated, perhaps. Um, and I have a daughter, of course, I want my daughter to be fully, I want all the possibilities there for if she wants to be president or prime minister or a ballet, I want her to do whatever she can. So I'm quite a feminist in that sense. I want women to be fully expressed. Yeah. But on the other hand, you get strident feminists in the US or in the way who are like man haters. Yeah. And they will never, you hold a door open for them and they're like, fuck you, I can hold my own door. So then you have this, yeah, it's a nightmare. You, I think for me, what worked for me personally was a woman who was younger, quite a bit, I, like I said, 13 years. So I had a lot more experience than she did in many things. Um, so she would follow my lead, but also strong-willed, confident and independent so she could speak her mind and hold, you know, a lot of, a lot of why I married my wife is because I respect her. Like she did, a lot of women gave in to what I would like, they were just compliant because they wanted approval. But she would, she's, uh, she'll stand her ground on principle, which I respect, even though it's not, I don't like it. But she's got a backbone, you know. And um, so, sounds exactly like my girlfriend, what you're describing. <laughs> cool. Uh, but I, you know, some guys want it's if if you like if you like your women like your furniture, then go yeah, go there. Like quiet stays in the place you left it. You can sit on it. That's nice. Like that's um, it makes for a comfortable lifestyle. I mean, believe me. Sometimes I wish my wife would not push back and I could just get my way, but it's a, it's a different type of relationship than right. it is with like a, a someone who's going to feel confident to challenge you and speak. Mm. And it takes also a strong guy. I mean, who, you have to be a, a, a strong guy to deal with a woman, like a, a independent woman's fucking point of view and stuff. And it's not always comfortable. I think, I think guys who are a little bit, weaker and and have less resolve they take comfort in the, like for example stereotypically asian you know they go to thailand the girl's never going to raise her voice never going to threaten never going to speak up never, so they're like it's an issue of control they feel like they're in control yeah i mean i find myself uh dating a lot of latin women and what i generally yeah. speaking like if we're going to generalize what i like about latin women is they're 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 fairly feisty and opinionated yeah. they're, they're not like super subservient by any stretch uh, like, you know, my girlfriend's like very opinionated and she's not out, out like basically it's every Latina girlfriend I've ever had. Uh, but at the same time, they're also like family oriented and they have like good relationships with their family. And that's important to them, which I find really bizarre that in American culture, which is not something, you know, how I mentioned pre-podcast, I'm from Russia originally, like in American culture, a lot of people don't have good relationships with their family. Like it, there's this notion once you're 18, you're on your own in America, which is like so different than Russian culture where it's like, you're with your family for life. Like, it doesn't matter if you're 30, you're still, you're not on your own. You're always with yeah, your family. Yeah. And that's like much more like, I think that is the kind of girl I'd rather have a relationship with who's much more family oriented. Uh, but at the same time, it like still speaks her mind and is her own individual human being rather than a chick who's just like, I don't know, just like whatever, just has like no family values and just like doesn't even care about having a relationship with her, you know, family, which to me is like kind of like iffy. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I understand that. Um, so that's kind of my take on, on, why or how why men go there and, and what those type of women are like generally and like there's a trade-off yeah so um and i think every man makes his own decision about like i'm sure you know you see you see relationships and you're like wow i could never tolerate that that type of woman in my life or you know and it, it might work for that guy it might not work for me so it, it is an individual choice mm. depending on the guy a mm. couple more questions yeah, yeah. Let's take some questions from the audience. Let's start off with this one. Ask Paul if it's still possible to buy his programs and products. Yes, it is. Yeah, you just go to. Um, I I can can I put 
anything here? Can I put it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, you can. Here, yeah. I'll say, oh, here, let me put it on the, um, and also I'm, um, first to next, we haven't really launched it. I'm, um, let me put this here. I will, hold on a second. I didn't realize you had this as, I know it's called live, whatever. Yeah, I didn't realize is also, yeah you can do anything. I didn't realize people were on the call. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 150 yeah. live viewers are watching. We're going to get thousands of people who are going to watch it on repeat. Yeah. People, no, are, it, people are, I, by the I way, no if you have some questions for Paul, uh, write them in now because, uh, uh, yeah, we're not going to go for too much longer. So if you have questions, just get them in now. Yeah, it, there, I just put my a link up there. I sell a product called Playboy to Papa. It's basically designed, the, the tagline is make the right moves in your 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. Wait, hang on yeah. a second, Paul. You, you, you posted in a private chat. The guys can't oh. see. So let me, let me uh, I'll, I'll put it up for you. Hang on a second. Oh, uh, thanks, man. Oh, yeah, it says private chat. Yeah. I there. never used this. Yeah. Cool. Um, it basically helps. It's designed to help guys make decisions as they get older and they mature. Uh, but I do cover a lot of my old pickup and I introduced something that I didn't have when I was in my original product line, which is called DNT. The guys go nuts for this. They love it. It's called decision node theory. And basically I've broken that into the story there in, really quickly. I had a coaching customer in New York who was autistic and I kept telling him to go out and do this and that and this. And he like, he couldn't interpret what I was saying or my material. Like it wasn't computing. So what I had to do, his name was Brett. I had to like break it down into like micro nodes. Okay. Like this is exactly what you do first. And he's like, Oh, okay. And then it's like, first you see the girl. It's like, oh, okay. So you see the girl and then, and then you start walking to her. So I broke it down into like these micro nodes, like excruciating detail. And then like what exactly you do on text, what exactly you do at the date, what exactly you do to bounce from the date, what you do when you're leading up to the flat, what, what you do when you enter the apartment, what you do when you first sit down, like, and, Basically, I stacked all these and then I started using this decision node theory on other men. And I realized like every guy who was sucking and not getting laid was break, falling down at one of these nodes. And, and what a lot of guys do is even if they suck at a node, they jump ahead. So like they're not great at pickup and but right. but they get the number somehow and they hit the girl up for and the girls are flaking. And it's like, no, it's because you, you didn't you didn't engage. You didn't build up rapport like sexual intrigue in the pickup. So but you have to go back and basically i've helped with this product i help guys stack all the nodes and once you once you've done it once and, and you have all the nodes working for you then like you can lay a thousand girls because it's just rinse and repeat but it's 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 perfecting the nodes along the chain and i start with visual ideas the first node like you see the girl in this in the social space all the way down to like on the bed having sex like what's that i don't give like sex techniques but like <laughs> so there in my experience there's there's 20 large nodes and then a bunch of micro. And, and if you work your game at each of these, you can improve until you stack them all and you can become a ninja, basically. Interesting. Sounds interesting, man. Yeah. All right. So, so here's here's another question. Uh, Paul, what happened to Dr. Paul? Yeah, I think he's around. I think he, um, thanks for the question. He, um, he was very good at giving advice. He's a psychiatrist, if people don't know. And I used to have a, a podcast with him. And he was a psychiatrist medical doctor who focused on men's issues anywhere from depression to anxiety to like low erectile dysfunction to low self-esteem whatever and he made a bunch of men's products and we co did stuff i think though he was never a great businessman and his businesses often like succeeded for a while and then failed and i think he got frustrated and he he can make a lot more money just being a doctor so i think he just decided to be a psychiatrist and it's what it's, he he lives in in between Denver and Chicago. I, I'm due to have a call with him. He had a child, a boy, but he um, I remember he quoted me his day rate as a psychiatrist, and it was like so much more money. And I think he decided like there was a lot of hassle being an entrepreneur. So, yes, yeah. gotcha. Okay, this is another interesting question, Paul. What advice would you give to guys who are approaching anxiety or approach strangers while out in public during the day? Uh, just choose a place that's anonymous, like where there's a lot of foot traffic in your city, if you can, and then just force yourself to go do and do indirect approaches first, like walk up to girls and be like, Hey, do you know where Starbucks is or what time it is just to start? You don't have to hit on them per se. And then, and then once you feel a little bit confident that and just push through the fear, then start to stay and set set a little bit longer and start to make comments about her. Like, Oh, that's a nice sweater. Oh, that's a cute dog. Or I like those boots. And then, 
there's a whole, I mean, I can teach you the whole thing and it's in my products, but once you make it personal, then you can give a hook and then you transition to hurt like the date and you pitch like the, something very simple, like, uh, well, this is a little bit past approach anxiety, but like a coffee date or something like if you're doing indirect, but, but it sounds like your fear is you have a hard time walking up to a stranger and opening your mouth. So you, you just got to do that. But, and you can start with, with, the truth is you can start with men and older women and it's called being the mayor. Just go up to a dude and be like, Hey man, where's the, like, if he's holding a Starbucks, be like, well, Hey, where's the Starbucks around here? Start doing that. You have to break through that fear of talking to a stranger. You can talk to an old lady walking a dog, like, Oh, do you know where a good pet store is? And once you get a little comfortable with these non hot chick targets, then you migrate to the hot chick target. And the, basically you, you just need to, to ease into it. Yeah, just don't get confused and accidentally bang the dude or something. <laughs> Yo, Paul, I tried your method, and uh, for some reason, I want to bang this guy. Like, uh. <laughs> That's cool if you're into it, man. Go ahead. Uh, let's take like, two more questions. We'll, we'll just go through quick ones. These are pretty good, though. How did your life change after Dr. Phil's show? You said you don't like fame, if I remember right. So how do you respond to life changes after? Well, we built a business, and we made millions of dollars, so I just focused on that, basically. Um, the... the uh, I was on a bunch of other shows and uh, it was a fun, I mean, I enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed it for what it was. It was the attention, but I think some guys get into this and uh, um, well, Alex, you were saying like some guys love the spotlight and they, they, um, so I didn't, I didn't want to become like a reality show guy or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So I, we, we were working years ago on a, on a TV show kind of based on Larry David's sense of humor about, uh, called uh, Dime Store Casanovas, and we got kind of far with the line producer in some episodes. But unfortunately, I didn't focus enough on it because that would have been interesting. But like, there's a definitely comedic element to like being a pickup artist and stuff. Yeah, so there's a lot, a lot of funny stories I have, can have to teach you. I yeah. can tell you. Go ahead. Yeah, what yeah, else? yeah. And let's take this. Let's make this the last question. After how many lays would you recommend start thinking about setting? That's oh, a very good question. I would say like bare minimum fifty. Uh, and then like, if, if you screwed 50 chicks by the time, like in your mid thirties, mid thirties, you, you pretty much know wh what women are about and like how, one of the things you want to always have is like, you, you want your tool belt. So you should always think like, if my girl turfed me out and I had to start from scratch, could I get laid? So you want, you want to have a skill set to like, I'm, I'm super rusty because I, I've been married for a long time, but I still think that if, if. If you put me in a, in, a, in a new city and I had to get laid after a week or so, I could get my game back and I could do it. Like you, you people, men sometimes stay in relationships because they're so afraid of being single again. And that's a terrible thing. We talk about scarcity. You always, you always want to know that like you could walk if you had to, if your girl mm -hmm. did something crazy, like you could move on in your life. So it, it's good to always, but after you bang 50 chicks, you know what you're doing pretty much. Um, I would say as a minimum, after you've banged about a hundred girls, you, you pretty much have done it all probably and seen it all and all that kind of thing. So it, it might be fun for a few more hundred. I don't know. John Anthony claims these huge numbers. I, you're going to spend a lot of time and, and, and effort. You have to be sure you want to do that kind of lifestyle, but after a hundred, you probably it's diminishing returns in my opinion. So you could start yeah. thinking about um, if you want to settle down, you, you, there's probably not much more out there for you. So yeah, I want to comment on one thing you said that I thought was interesting. You said yeah. that like, if you put me in the city, like even though I've been married for 10 years within a week, that's very kind of uh, – that's the experience I had. In the, I've never been married for 10 years, but I did have a long relationship. And what, when the relationship ended, I was like worried. I was like, holy shit, I'm about to like relearn all this stuff. Uh, it literally took a week. Within a week, I was 99% back to where I was. So once you have the skill, uh, you can get to largely where you were at in a very quick period of time. Like I think if you, for example, uh, you know, were forced to go pick up girls, you might not be hundred percent where you were, but you could be like 95% within a few weeks. Yeah. I think, yeah. And, and that confidence is good because it, I mean, in a way it's like your girl can't push you around too much. Cause you can be like, well, put, you know, you, you act up too much. The door's right there. I'm going to get going on what's my, I mean, I, 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 I'm not saying threaten your girlfriend or threaten wives and stuff, but what I'm saying is it's, it's always good to have to have the skill set because you never know where life's going to take you. And after you've banged like 50 chicks, you, you probably know what you're doing to a fair mm -hmm. degree. Because keep in mind, the average American man, so I think he sleeps with seven women in his whole lifetime. Right. 
And yeah. it's just just last comment on that. It's a bit sad because I've coached you know you know thousands of guys over the years, and um, the the uh, the saddest thing is guys who just can never get it together, and they have to like pay for for hookers. Yeah. I'm not against that necessarily, but they're paying for hookers all the time, and that's their only yeah. sexual outlet is if they pay for it, yeah. or and or they're just like getting shut down all the time they've never gotten to a place where they have the confidence to take control and like fuck that bitch and get her down on her knees like it, so you want to be able to have that muscle uh -huh. somewhere in your arsenal basically yeah 100 percent agreed uh yeah dude thanks so much do you have any closing thoughts or anything else you want to mention um well uh i'll put this uh this link here um and if you if anyone wants to follow up, let me put here. I'll put it here. My email because I we are just I, I I'm not marketing it yet. But um, hold on. Here, there, Paul at Playboy to pop. If anyone on this call is interested, hang on. I have to. I have to because that's uh, that's still private chat. So let me just yeah, uh, put it. How do I put it in the main thing? Uh, you just you're under private chat right now. You just have to hit comments. But it's oh, okay. comments. Oh, can you put I'll, it in? I'll, yeah, I'll do it for you. Okay, yeah. well, what I was gonna say is we're. I have a team of. Uh, a guy who who's very good he plans all of kezia noble's uh, events mm. he's a good friend of mine yeah. uh he, the two of us and and a third guy who's on our sales team we're, we're planning in uh, a miami retreat in the in like october november but um so i live in london i'm gonna fly over and so is pete he's very good at making it a lot of fun we're, we're gonna bring in some coaches british coaches for street game and all that but we're gonna do like a four-day thing in miami at a rent a big airbnb and we're limiting it to just 10 guys and uh we, we just started the marketing so this is like the first i'm announcing it actually and the the whole thing is is like we're going to go over elements of game but also a lot of the stuff about like where you are in your life and one thing i'm excited to do is i'm doing these these uh these uh beachside walks with every every client so there's 10 guys i'm going to structure the schedule i'm going to spend an hour with every guy walking the beach just privately Ooh, talking about romantic. yeah 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 with the sunset no but this idea of like talking because a lot of guys open their soul hearts to me they're like yeah man or, or they're, they're like in a difficult situation or whatever so it just like a walk a pride to, 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 to i know it's a sun right? to talk about um where sunset you are in your life yeah 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 uh with viol you know violin music no but uh, I don't the wife get jealous <laughs> yeah that's right to talk about where you are in your life and like sticking points it could be as simple as like you don't know how we can go through all the mechanics of pickup and getting laid or you don't know whether to leave your girl or leave your marriage to get back in the day and scene or you don't know to have a kid and you're like we're worried about it. so it's just it's just time with me one-on-one -on -one, uh walking without and i'm really looking forward to that because that's my favorite part of this is like getting to know guys in their particular situations and where like they're often at like a, a, a they're at they're at a fork in the road so but there's also going to be fun stuff we're going to go out we're going to we're going to have like lectures on a, a specific lecture on dnt decision note theory stuff on style we're going to go out to nightclubs and, and my so it should just be a fun like four day four to four or five day thing so we're i haven't done one of these in ages so Every time I say DMT, my mind just thinks DMT for like a split second. And then I start thinking back to my DMT experience and I realize you're talking about something different. What is DMT? It's a drug, is it? Yeah, it's a drug. You like smoke it and you get like ultra fucked up for like five minutes. You just go into a parallel universe where you see aliens and shit, but it only lasts like five, 10 minutes, which makes, which is what I like about because I don't like psychedelics that last like hours. Um, <laughs> I, had some, I had some interesting experiences with DMT when I was younger. Uh, but yeah, man, hit me up when you come to Miami. Maybe we'll link up for a little bit. Yeah, I'm supposed to. Those guys from Fit and Fresh want me on. I know they have a big oh, <laughs> Fit and Fresh. Fresh and Fit, you mean? <laughs> fresh and Fit. Yeah, sorry. I really got backwards. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I was an OG back in the day with day games. So, there, there's a lot. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to come down. I'm going to do that. I'm going to, we're just going to hit the scene. I know my experience in Miami is the girls are off the chain, like South Beach and all that stuff. It'd be interesting if we do meet up. And it's a, it, it's a hard nut to crack there. I found other cities easier. The girls were really good looking but they were flaky and i feel like mm -hmm. everything's in a, a, a transaction in miami like mm -hmm. looks for money looks for cocaine whatever so it, it's 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 tough to like it's very a hot chick's very much about like what am i going to get out yeah. of this yeah y'all do 100 you hit the nail on the head i mean it's more cloud cloud's the biggest thing so yeah like we'll we'll do interviews with girls on our podcast and they'll be maybe they're attractive girls but nothing special like maybe sevens and you know we'll be like yeah so what are you doing after the podcast they're like oh you know uh diplo wants to hang out and then i got uh dj khaled who invited me to this party i'm like 
what the actual fuck like yeah so like the girls have so many insane options like we've done these experiments like for example another one before we end this off is uh we create a tinder profile as an overweight obese girl who weighs 300 pounds like we're talking about the most unattractive girl ever. She got 500 matches in 24 hours. Guys were begging her to hang out. We're talking about a one here. That is how insanely skewed the marketplace is. Right now, we're doing an even more interesting experiment. We took my photos, my Tinder photos. We went on FaceApp, and we hit the button that you know turns you into a girl. So took photos of me, uh, added like basically a wig to it, and we put it on Tinder to see if there's a difference. That Alexa, as we called her, got 1,000 likes in 24 hours. So dudes... There's so many dudes who want to fuck a female version of me way more than chicks who want to fuck like the actual real male version of me, which is like blows your mind. Uh, so well, yeah. Yeah, just quickly, why? I mean, part of my success in New York was the marketplace is very skewed because you have a lot of gay men that are out of the equation. You have guys who work all the time, so they're not competition. And then you have a huge amount of girls used to move there because of sex right. in the city. They wanted to lead. They, right. I mean, they, after college, they're like 24. They want to have like cocktails and wear, you know, wear high heels and have martinis. And and so the, the, the city was flooded with single women in their early 20s, 20, like 24, 25. And there were very few men. So my, my buddy who also cleaned up used to say, if you're single, straight and solvent, if you have a little bit of money. You can you can just do that's why New York men generally are assholes. Women complain because they, they, they they're spoiled for choice. So it's a great place to be a dude. It sounds like Miami is the opposite. Although there are a lot of women, aren't there? Or is it just that there's a lot more men? Than women? There's a lot more men. The competition is high. So a much better city for picking up women as a straight guy would be like Tampa or Orlando, uh, right? Because not a lot. And also, of the guys are pretty diesel. I mean, the Miami guys are like super jacked and yeah, a lot of good looking guys. The competition is really, really high. Like really high. Like I mean, at one point I remember this was like four or five, and it gets harder and harder every year. But like four or five years ago, I had my girlfriend at the time. We had her make a Tinder profile as like a joke, just to see like what. And it was like insane. I mean, guys were like offering to get her into exclusive parties, like anything and everything. And she only had like two photos, and they didn't even show her body. So it just like kind of puts things in perspective, like how insane the competition is. And once you see it from that perspective, you see it from the lens of a girl, which I have many times, like you kind of, it kind of humbles you and you kind of realize, okay, the competition's insane. So everything I do has to be on point. My margin for error is really, really low because yeah, these girls have so many fucking options, right? If I even fuck up. So would you more, say that it's a bad, it's for men, it's not a great dating environment? No, I don't think it is at all. If you're a celebrity, then yeah. If you're a regular guy, then no. Interesting. I would always like if a guy's like, yo, Alex, what city should I move out to uh, for picking up girls? I would always in the if we're talking the US recommend a second tier city, uh, more like maybe Albuquerque, New Mexico, Phoenix, Arizona, um, Cincinnati, uh, like St. Louis, Pittsburgh, second tier cities are going to be so much better as a marketplace for dating than like popular first tier cities like Miami and Los Angeles. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Well, hey, man. Good yeah. Stuff. Yeah. Thanks for coming on, dude. I think it was a really good discussion. It's interesting. Yeah. It's interesting, like all the overlap that uh, we have. But yeah, man. Uh, Are you gonna let me know when this is posted, and then uh, it's, we'll it's gonna be posted immediately. This goes live like That's as soon cool. as I end the broadcast. This gets posted. You got your shit together, man. I'm impressed. So uh, the uh, we'll circle back in a few weeks and and see how people receive these. And um, yeah, an honored to be on. Thanks for thanks for persisting. It's good to meet you. I think John's <laughs> gonna have me on, and will interesting to hear. I know he's living the crazy life. I, I had to run some text game on Paul. I had to uh, hit yeah, yeah. takeaway, you know, false time constraints. Yeah, uh, yeah. it was a challenge. No, I'm, I'm, <laughs> cool. glad, I'm glad we can make the podcast happen. Cool, man. All right, best of luck. Say hi to yeah, John. Nice I'll, I think I'm gonna be on his show soon too. And uh, nice. if I'll I come to Miami, I'll, I'll drop you a line. Dude, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Let me know when you make cool. it out here. Cool, good bro. Stuff. All right, dude. Have a good one, man. Take care. Bye, guys. Thanks.